All right, if you want to go ahead and find a seat this morning, we'll get started. So great to see everyone. Thank you for being with us here. We've got a good group out on the patio as well. If maybe you're not sure where that's at, that's just uh, behind this wall. There's a big TV and audio uh, system set up for those out on the patio that are enjoying the nice weather this Mother's Day. And then we have a group online as well. Thanks so much for joining us online. And for those of you in the chapel, thank you for being here. It's great to see you. Uh, as we start our message today, we're, we've been in a series called Easter Tide, and that's just a 50-day uh, time in the church calendar in between Easter and Pentecost, uh, Pentecost Sunday. So it's a time where Jesus is showing up in unexpected places, unexpected ways, and restoring faith into his disciples. And I, I want to start this morning with a couple of questions. One is, who do you trust? Who do you trust? So think about that for just a moment. You can make an internal list of maybe some people, hopefully some people you can trust. I know that the reality of that for some of us is like, I can't trust anyone. And if you're here in that place today, you're welcome here. And then think about this. Who do you love? Who do you love? You can maybe think of a list of people that you love and care for. I know for some people, the question would be, who do you trust? I don't trust anybody. Who do I love? I love everyone. But I believe that love at its core involves trust, a lot of trust. I don't think you can actually truly love without trust. Therapists and psychologists would tell us that trust is the foundation of any healthy relationship. Uh, the philosophers Lady Gaga and Beyonce <laughs> <laughs> said trust is like a mirror. You can fix it if it's broken, but you can still see the crack in that, I won't say the rest, reflection. If you know the line, you know what I skipped. Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher, cultural critic, and atheist. <laughs> Big switch here. We're trying to cover all of our bases, all right? Uh, I'm not upset that you lied to me, he wrote. I'm upset that from now on, I can't believe you. Trust is a foundational part of experiencing and giving love in relationships, both with people and God. Trust is also something we give as a, a gift to both ourselves and to others. It, it provides the support needed to relationally bond with others. When a trust has been broken, trauma happens in our soul. And we must learn to develop this wise and resilient trust that is full of discernment, is full of forgiveness, and a space for difference in order to keep the bond of trust alive in us. Learning to give and receive trust, this forms the bond that forms loving relationships. Faith at its core, its core essence is a, a trust in God. It's the relational bond that, and glue that holds us together with God. It's a conduit of relationship. It, to become people who have a faith stronger than doubt, we must learn to allow our hearts to trust God more fully. And what we believe about God directly determines whether we can place our trust in God. Beliefs matter greatly, but they're not mutually exclusive, belief and faith. In fact, James writes about even the demons believing in the one true God and being in fear of that truth. But they didn't have faith, they didn't have a trust, bonded relationship with God. They just knew who God was. We can believe things about who God is without ever having a personal trust or faith in God. Nearly, uh, D David Kinnaman wrote a book in 2011 called You Lost Me. Now, this is almost 11 years old now. It was written quite some time ago. But he said uh, this statistic from Barna said nearly 60% of people raised in Christian churches deconstruct their faith following high school. 
That's a terrifying statistic, and we don't have an updated one that at least I'm aware of as of now, but I would guess that that percentage is much higher. So as a part of this message, I want to address some of the very real dangers in this process of deconstruction and doubt, and we're going to look at the story of Thomas, the famous story of doubting Thomas. Unfortunately, he was kind of given that name, but it was just a moment of doubt for him. It wasn't a define his life a thing for him. And, and I want to share this out of a genuine love and care for those who may be walking through losing their faith, a crisis of faith or a process of deconstruction, as well as for those who are walking with others who are doing the same, who are going through it. Uh, A.J. Swoboda is an assistant professor of Bible theology and world Christianity at Bushnell University. He also leads a doctor of ministry program around the Holy Spirit and leadership at Fuller Theological Seminary. He's the author of a number of books, including the award-winning Subversive Sabbath, great book about Sabbath practice. He recently wrote uh, the book After Doubt, How to Deconstruct your faith without losing it. And I want to just read some portions of this. It's one that I've been reading through and trying to understand this process more that's kind of sweeping our cultural moment and especially the young people in our generation as they are trying to understand what is good and right and helpful when it comes to their belief in who God is and what's been handed down to them and trying to understand what do I hold on to? What do I take apart? What's true? What's reliable? What's helpful? Here's some of the things he wrote. He said uh, in his book, After Doubt, part of the reason so many young people deconstruct their faith so radically after leaving home is that they were never given a chance to differentiate in the earlier years. Speaking of differentiation in the family unit with their parents and their own individual life and beliefs, this deconstruction age is as much a reflection of our longing for boundaries as anything else. We react and even overreact against the faith of our communities or families of origin because we're often never given the agency as people in our younger years. So it's kind of a, a, an inability to think divergently or to think creatively or to use your imagination when it comes to faith and form your own beliefs and allow those to be refined and developed as you become an adult. And it was just like, here's what you need to believe. Believe it or it's done. Not helpful. <laughs> A.J. Swoboda goes on to say, deconstruction is a double-edged sword. It can edify our faith by helping us critically think rethink wrong beliefs, but it can also go too far and bring our faith to nothing. There's a world of difference between deconstructing wrong beliefs and deconstructing the faith. Just as there's a difference between remodeling a room in our home and tearing down the house. Distinguishing between the two is essential. One is intellectual repentance, the other faith abandonment. One is healthy deconstruction, the other is faith destruction. In fact, a true and living faith will often require us to undertake some type of deconstruction of our beliefs. I love this picture of house renovation. My wife and I uh, moved into an older home uh, about four years ago, and we began to do some work on it because it had not been updated in a long time. The original owner's uh, lived and rose a family and lived out their retirement years in this house. They were the one original owners. And it you, you could tell that there was not some updates uh, ever <laughs> since it had been built. And we began kind of room by room. We started with the floors, which was not a great idea. But we were figuring it out. We're like, we can do that. Refinishing hardwood floors. Yeah, we got that. We'll rent the sander. It'll be fine. It was a lot of work, and we probably would not do it again. Um, right, but we started there because we're like, that's the most comprehensive thing. Floors are everywhere in the house. We got to start there. And then we went on to the bathroom. There was like a handicapped tub in one of the bathrooms. We like, can't use that. Kids don't want to take a bath in there. It's terrifying to them. So we tore that out and put in a bathtub and remodeled the bathroom. And each of, if you've ever remodeled something in your house, you know that it's not fun. 
the end result is great, but the process is exhausting and it's messy and it's frustrating. You usually come to a place where you need some sort of couples therapy or counseling, right? <laughs> and, and that's part of the process. You're not just building into a physical home, but you're building into your family, right? Uh, but if, if you were, yeah, that's deep, right? That's deep. <laughs> But if, if, if you were to like move into a home like the one we moved into, and you're like, let's just, we'll move in and then we'll just tear it all to the studs, live there, and do it all at once, it wouldn't work. <laughs> you wouldn't have a home to live in. You'd have a, an, a, an alley, basically, of people coming in and out and loud noises and no rest and nowhere to really sleep because there would be constant work that would have to be done in order to make it a livable house and space. Now, if we think of our faith in that terms, to just tear it all apart all at once is not a wise way to go about deconstruction. We need to do it. There are, are moments where we need to remodel some spaces. We need to rethink and we need to live in the tension of like, I want to do that project, but I also need to use the bathroom. I want to do that project, but I also need a place to sleep. I want to do that project, but I also need a place to cook meals for my family. So to Think about it in terms of that of like, okay, let's be patient in the process and recognize there's areas that we may need to take apart. We may need to reconstruct. Yes, there needs to be demo day, but don't demo the whole house if you still need a place to live. Take your time. Here's a, a, another quote from AJ. He said, this is a long one, but I think it's worth reading because it's helpful. At least it was for me. One extreme, reflective of conservative Christianity, wants us to believe that doubt and deconstruction are inherently bad, a pathway inevitably leading to the cliffs of apostasy and faith abandonment. This extreme denies that deconstruction can be leg at a legitimate place to encounter the living God. Here, deconstruction is caricatured as an all-out assault from the forces of of darkness on truth, the church, Christian culture, and ultimately the gospel. If we really had faith in Jesus, they would say, we wouldn't have doubts or questions about it. This is blissful nostalgia. Not to mention that it's the very black and white approach to faith that created the deconstruction environment we find ourselves in, where the young opt to leave the church because their difficulties aren't allowed within it. We can all thank God that doubting Thomas didn't have his doubt crisis in a fundamentalist conservative church. They would have told him he didn't believe anymore, that he was doomed to destruction. Still, the extreme of the theological left is as destructive. The ideology and spirit of a good deal of progressive Christianity almost requires us to undo traditional Christianity as a kind of compulsory experience. This is the sign that we're evolved and liberated. Emerging from this seems to be a kind of laissez-faire approach to historic Christianity that rejects Jesus as the only way to God while seeming to suggest that doubt and deconstruction are ironically the only way to God. Here, the Enneagram has more weight than the words of Scripture. Podcasts trump one's service to the Bride of Christ. And theology is acceptable so long as it's sanitized of anything that might offend a Sunday afternoon audience on NPR. This has led to a kind of Gnostic clique of naysayers who rest their pride on finding every last vestige of dirt on the church and the Bible with a pretense of arrogance that can be nauseating. Go to the internet descend into the angsty, hopeless cesspool of Christian nihilism readily available online, and you'll know what we're talking about. Both sides miss the boat. One demonizes doubt, the other demands it. The goal, of course, isn't to run away from deconstruction, nor to run towards it. The goal is Jesus Christ and nothing less. It is Christ's kingdom, God's rule and reign in all things. I think a very fair assessment of the cultural moment and how we can approach deconstruction in a helpful way and deal with our doubts. So this week, as we continue our Easter Tide series, we're going to look at this story of Thomas out of John 20, verses 24 through 29. 
And uh, if you'd like to follow along with me, you're welcome to. But this is post-resurrection, crucifixion, resurrection Jesus. And he's showing up in these mysterious ways with his disciples in unexpected places and even unrecognizable at times to those around. We don't know quite exactly why Jesus was so unrecognizable to his disciples, but there would be these moments where all of a sudden they'd be like, oh, that's Jesus. Here's what John 20 records. And this is after the story that Josh Bueno uh, covered last week in talking about Jesus meeting with the disciples and Thomas wasn't there. And one of the 12 disciples was not with the others when Jesus came, John 20 records. They told him, we have seen the Lord. They're talking to Thomas. But Thomas replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound, into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. With the same greeting he had with his disciples previously, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas explained, exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. So I talk about some ways of dealing with doubt and having a faith that's stronger than our doubts and honestly facing those moments of crisis of faith that we all walk through in our life. The first is confession of our doubt to God and others. We see Thomas courageously giving words to what was going on within him. As they exclaimed to him that we've seen the Lord, Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless... Unless these things happen, I can't believe that Jesus is risen. Thomas is open and honest about his doubt within the community of faith. And the community doesn't kick Thomas out or publicly shame him for his lack of faith. He's still with them at at the next gathering eight days later. And Jesus does not ignore Thomas' doubt. He does not distance himself from Thomas' doubt. Jesus moves into Thomas's doubt in a personal, intimate, and vulnerable way. And Jesus meets him where he is at. Jesus becomes the pursuer of Thomas, moves closer to him in his crisis of faith. And when Jesus shows up, he doesn't shame Thomas. He simply invites him to an experiential knowledge, a way of knowing that faced his doubt head on. So if you have some doubts you're dealing with, don't be ashamed of them. Find some trusted people to share them with because you were never meant to walk that road alone. And invite God into that process. There's a prayer of a father for his son in Mark 9, 24. And this father comes to Jesus and asks Jesus to heal his son. And his prayer is, I do believe Jesus, but help me overcome my unbelief. To know that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. He shows up amidst our doubt and helps us. He doesn't run from us. He shows up and helps us with it. So to invite God and others into that confession of doubt. Dealing with doubt, number two, second point, practice presence through dark nights. It says eight days later, Thomas was still there. He didn't stop showing up because he had doubts. He continued to be present amidst it. I want to encourage you to do the same. If you're facing doubt, if you're facing points of deconstruction in some area of your faith journey, don't check out. Check in. 
with a hopeful anticipation that eventually God will meet you in that space and help you understand more clearly and experience more fully the love of God in Christ. The church has 2,000 years almost of history facing, dealing with doubt, reconstruction, and reformation. If you look at church history, there's this constant reinvention of the church as people begin to hold the church accountable in a prophetic way. And if we even look before the church, the prophets of the Old Testament, it's one of the few world religions where the prophets hold the faith responsible for their actions. There's this prophetic tradition of everyday people like you and me reconstructing faith in the church around what Jesus intended for it to be through the Spirit of God. If we were to consider belief as glasses, I have to clean these glasses constantly. Why? Because I have three young kids. They like to put their hands in my face. They like to play with these glasses. They like to walk around the house with these glasses, and they get nasty, right? And it's like, I can barely see sometimes. It's like, you walk out of the house, and the sun shines on my, sun, sun shines on my glasses. I'm like, I can't. It's just a blur. I can't see anything. And to know that faith is similar. Sometimes we're just like, okay, I need to take these off. I need to clean the lenses. I need to be able to fix my eyes on Jesus. I've, I've been distracted. There's been too many smudges. I can't even see clearly. And there's other times where the glasses are clean and I still can't see. I need to go and get my prescription updated. There's moments where there needs to be some attention given and some refocus. Here's the deal. I have known my fair share of doubt and deconstruction. I I took time to write out a list of different moments where I've struggled with my faith, where there's been areas where I'm like, I don't get this. I don't understand how this is working. And I've served in a lot of different church environments and a lot of different pastoral places from like youth pastor to associate pastor. I was a worship pastor for a little while. I was a youth intern in college. So like I didn't get paid, but I did all the work for the youth pastor. Like I, I've done pretty much everything but children's ministry, but I've also had three kids uh, at home. So I guess I've had a little bit of experience there too. But I, I share this just to normalize the experience a bit. It, this is not comprehensive. It's not um, uh, kind of in a timeline of my life. Of, of my life, please don't use it against me. It's a vulnerable thing that I'll share. And there's a story attached to each one of these. There's a list of twenty. I won't read them all because we don't have time. And that's not comprehensive. Uh, let, let me share a few, and I don't have time to share the stories attached to e- each one, although I've shared different stories throughout my time of pastoring here at Society Church. I've, I've deconstructed my own ignorance of the gospel, which involved embracing and reconstructing the love of God in Christ for me. I didn't even know what I didn't know. I've deconstructed loneliness and isolation, and in, which involved embracing and reconstructing my engagement within the beloved community as a, consist, as a consistent part of the church. I, I've deconstructed my own bitterness and self-righteousness, and I'm still on the journey of that. Right? But this involved embracing and reconstructing forgiveness, facing family of origin issues, with humility and love. I've deconstructed cultural sexuality, which involved embracing and reconstructing a biblical view of gracious, spiritual, relational, genderized, covenantal sexuality. I've deconstructed my plans and my ways. I have fallen on my face and failed many times in life, and I, which involved embracing and reconstructing a sense of divine purpose and calling with God. God cares about my life. I've deconstructed the separation of sacred and secular, this view that this is holy and godly and this isn't, and in, which involved embracing and reconstructing an integrated spirituality in all of life. I deconstructed uh, 
my, my own power, intellect, and abilities to accomplish, which involved embracing and reconstructing the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given freely. Deconstructed megachurch ministry. Yes, I have served in large, a large church when I was in college. It was a megachurch. And in, it involved embracing and reconstructing a localized missional vision of the global church, faith, and life, and community. I've deconstructed my childhood theology, which involved embracing and reconstructing a more complete theological view of God, discipleship, and the scriptures. I've deconstructed universalism, religious polytheism, cultural pluralism, and cultic spirituality. And I've had some experiences in some of these realms. And it involved embracing and reconstructing a specific, historically orthodox way of knowing and relating to God through Christ. I've deconstructed Western Christianity. Embracing and reconstructing a global, historic, orthodox view of both orthodoxy and orthopraxy, the practice of right belief. Deconst I've walked through deconstruction of authoritarian, patriarchal leadership and embraced uh, and, and reconstructed a vision for men and women empowered to lead in the kingdom of Jesus. I've deconstructed closed denominationalism and I've embraced and reconstructed a vision for the globi, global, multi-ethnic Christian church. I've deconstructed racism and privilege, and I'm still on a journey of coming to a greater awareness of these things in me, and embrace and reconstructing a vision for mercy, humility, justice, service, and the multi-ethnic kingdom of God meant for all people. I've worked through deconstructing personal insecurities, embraced and reconstructed my identity in Christ, that I have enough because God is with me. I've deconstructed some of my religious ritual and embraced and reconstructed a vision for the church of making disciples in the way and teaching of Jesus that has many different beautiful approaches. Deconstructed civil religion, embraced and reconstructed a vision of God's kingdom that is not hemmed in by a political and economic person, people, or powers. Deconstructed some relational insecurity and embraced and reconstructed a secure relational structure with God in the center my wife and trusted friends and mentors as stabilizing forces in my life, an intentional community of shared mutual support and layers of community surrounding that. I've deconstructed formulaic ideas about God that I've been taught, embraced and reconstructed a relational set of intentional practices that help me to be more present to God, myself and others. I've deconstructed some of my need for a settled, idyllic, predictable life. I've embraced and reconstructed the adventure of living and leading in the power of God's spirit wherever it may lead me and my family. The purpose of doubt is to cause us to go deeper with God. This is part of developing a theology of pursuit. God is a God who pursues us and invites us into pursuit of him bit like a game of cat and mouse. Like any good relationship, there is an invitation into mutual pursuit and responsiveness. Now, if you are just only pursuing a, a friend or a person and they never reciprocated that, that's not a friendship, right? That's not a relationship. God's the same way. He invites us into this mutual pursuit of responsiveness responsiveness. So the encouragement, practice presence through the dark night. Whatever doubts you're dealing with, know that others have likely dealt with them as well. Dealing with doubt, don't let doubt have the final word. Don't let doubt have the final word. Jesus says to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. The translation I read said, don't be faithless any longer and believe. The word simply for don't be faithless, stop doubting, is to stop having a lack of credibility 
Stop being unfaithful or without faith. And the word for believe is simply to be trustworthy, reliable, full of faith, believing. Doubt is a great tool to lead us to pursuit of Jesus, but a lousy place to live. James does an amazing job at describing the long-term effects of living in doubt. In James 1, verses 3 through 9, this is the amplified version, which is fun because it brings a lot of different descriptions of the words associated with this original text. He says, Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, which is a, a leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. And let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom to guide them through a decision or circumstance, they are to ask of our benevolent God who gives to everyone generously without rebuke or blame, and it will be given to them. But they must ask for wisdom in faith without doubting God's willingness to help. For the one who doubts is like a billowing surge of the sea that is blown about and tossed by the wind. For such a person ought not to think or expect that they will receive anything at all from the Lord. Being a double-minded human, unstable, and restless in all their ways, in everything they think, feel, or decide. What if we willingly confessed our doubt to God and others, and then proceeded to ask for God to come in and help our unbelief and ask God in faith to help us understand and see more clearly, be filled with the wisdom of God to navigate even the most complex situations in our life. And what if we trusted that God would provide clarity and an answer in due time? Because our God is trustworthy and willing to help. Here's what I think James is trying to remind us about. That if we're to have knowledge of God, and some people have a lot of knowledge of God. I've met a lot of people even in this congregation. I'm like, you know a lot about God. But if we're to multiply that times doubt, doubt is a multiplier of zero. So all of a sudden, it it doesn't matter what you know about God if you don't trust God him. Because that bond of trust is what multiplies his presence in and through and saturates our life for the benefit of others. So a knowledge which leads to a belief multiplied times faith, a loving trust, a bond of trust with God produces an uncountable impact. Here's some resources for you if you're like, I don't know how to get through my crisis of faith, or I don't know how to walk with a friend or family member or someone I care about through this in a faithful way. Here's some great resources. Uh, A.J. Swoboda, After Doubt, How to Deconstruct Your Faith Without Losing It. Dominic Doan wrote, Uh, When Faith Fails, Finding God in the Shadow of Doubt. He also has a website called pursuingfaith.org that I think is a really helpful one. Brian Zond uh, wrote, When Everything is on Fire, (laughs) Faith Forged from the Ashes. Uh, Rebecca McLaughlin wrote, Confronting Christianity, 12 Hard Questions for the World's Largest Religion, and does a lot of honest asking and research that I think is really helpful. There's two podcasts I put up there as well, Faith and Doubt podcast. That is by A.J. Swoboda and one of his friends as they walk through that. And then Theology and the Raw by Preston Sprinkle, his willingness to just talk through really hard, complex, difficult issues of our day. I think he's done a great job there. But we see Thomas ending not with allowing doubt to get the last word, but he says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. 
Thomas exclaims, my Lord and my God, he comes back to a a trusting, loving faith in who Jesus is. He worked through some of the deconstruction in his mind about Jesus was supposed to be a political power that would overthrow Rome and bring freedom for Israel and and, and a political authority. And, and, And Thomas was like, wait, he did something much bigger than that. He overcame sin, hell, death, and the grave. And to provide good news of great joy meant for all people, not just the people of Israel. Wow, my Lord and my God. Some historians tell of the accounts that uh, Thomas uh, traveled through Iran, what we know of of, as Iran and Iraq, to his way to southern India after coming back to faith. The Smithsonian Magazine uh, wrote that the surprising early history of Christianity in, in, in India, modern Syrian Christians of Kerala believe that the Apostle Thomas, the one who so famously questioned Jesus, visited here in AD 52 and baptized their forefathers. Historians surmise that the diverse, rich trading center of Kerala may well have drawn this Palestinian Jew from the Roman Empire who wished to preach the gospel. Thousands of churches today still bear his name. Their rituals and theology derive from Eastern Orthodox traditions in the liturgical language of Syriac, a formation of Aramaic, the dialect of Jesus and Thomas. Thomas wasn't willing to let doubt have the final word. What might the multiplier of faith have for our life, have for our family, for our relationships, for the purpose that we hold within this world? For many of us, we don't know. And that's part of developing this bond of trust to the one who is the most trustworthy, And as I conclude today, the the invitation is going to be for those who are dealing with doubt to develop a loving bond of trust with God. Maybe pray that prayer, God, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief in faith that God will meet us there and begin to do something new. For those of us who are walking with those, who are going through a crisis of faith, dealing with doubt, the hope is to create some space as we close the day just to pray for them, to invite God into that space with you, with them. I came across this video that is a song based upon a poem from a person by the name of, where is, there it is, Edward Shalot. Shilito. He was a free church minister in England during World War I, and he wrote this poem called Jesus of the Scars. And the premise of this poem, and it just kind of hit me in a way that felt very meaningful, is that Jesus is a God who struggles in life here on earth to the point of death to the point of crucifixion. And affirms that God revealed in Christ is worthy of our trust and faith because only a God with scars can be trusted. And throughout human history, Jesus is the only one who claimed to be God and had the scars to prove it that the love of God would be so great that he would not stop at death. So as we're going to listen, it's just a two-minute poem and reflection and to, to just bring either your own doubt before the Lord or to bring others' doubt that you may be walking with to God. And then I'll close in prayer and we'll finish up this morning. Let's take this time. If we have never sought, we'd seek thee now. We must have sight of thorn pricks on thy brow. Thine eyes burn through the dark, our only stars. 
We must have thee, O oh Jesus of the scars. The heavens frighten us, they are too calm. Our wounds are hurting us, where is the balm? In all the universe, we have no place. Lord Jesus, by thy scars we claim thy grace. We must have thee, O oh Jesus of the scars. We must have thee, O oh Jesus of the scars. If when the doors are shut, thou drawest near, we know today. What wounds are, have no fear. Only reveal those hands, that side of thine. Show us thy scars, we know the countersign. We must tell thee, O oh Jesus of the scars. We must tell thee, O oh Jesus. Of the scars. The other gods were strong, but thou was weak. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. And not a god has wounds, but thou alone. We must have thee, O oh Jesus of the scars. We must have thee, O oh Jesus of the scars. And he has us, O oh Jesus of the scars. Jesus of the scars. You meet us in our weakness with a presence that we know of as grace. It's undeserved. And it meets us in our deepest longings. You are the firm place to place our trust in as the most trustworthy one. The most loving presence in all of life. It's in you our trust finds its home and belonging where our restless hearts are made to find rest in. So in you, we find our heart's truest home in you today. Our longings brought to a place of fulfillment before you as you meet us in this space and meet our loved ones as well. Our love is found complete in you because you are the only complete love we will ever know. God, we offer the prayer together today. We do believe, but help us to overcome our places of unbelief. Jesus, you are our author and perfecter of our faith, so we fix our eyes on you in loving trust that you will lead us and those we love as a good, kind, gentle shepherd, even through the darkest of valleys. Oh, Jesus of the scars, it is in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Have a great Sunday. Grace and peace.